Hello and welcome to this virtual summit of ET Prime Women Leadership Awards. I'm Eloni Khan. When it comes to women in the formal workforce, India's numbers are very low. How can we boost these numbers to power India's shri economy and growth over the next few decades? And this is what my guests will delve into today. And I'm very happy to welcome my panel, starting with Sairi Chahal, founder of Shri Rose and founder of Mahila Money. She Rose is a social network for women with various communities to help women grow. Saidi, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Next, we have Jay Prakash GC. He's the founder director at Accrete Executive Search Private Limited. Accrete is a boutique executive search firm specializing in leadership hiring. Good to have you here, Jay. Thank you so much, Mulari. Next up, we have Advaita Kala. She is the author of the bestseller, Almost Single and an award-winning screenwriter. Advaita, welcome to Economic Times. Thank you. And finally, we have with us Dr. Nisha Taneja. She is a professor at Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations. She's worked as a consultant for the United Nations, World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank. She's a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Trade and Investment. Nisha, welcome. Thank you so much, Melody. Pleasure to be here. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're very happy to have all of you here. Nisha, if I could begin with you first. According to data from the World Bank in 2021, India's female labor force participation rate was about 20%, contributing to about 17% of GDP. But as per Indian government's data, women's workforce participation is around 25%. We know that women largely work in the informal sectors where their work is invisibilized and it pays very little. But as India prospers, the number of educated women increases fewer of them seem to be joining the workforce. And it seems very counterintuitive. So could you explain that? And what happens also when women's participation remains stagnant in the workforce or it slides further? Uh, Miloni, before I come to your question, I think there's a little bit of context uh, setting here, which is that we need to be thinking about uh, uh, gender mainstreaming in all economic activities and all policymaking initiatives at all levels, uh, horizontally and vertically. And so what that means is that we need to use a gender lens throughout the economy. And what we should be having is basically a national policy for gender mainstreaming. Uh, interestingly, we actually had a draft national policy for women, which was brought out in 2016. But unfortunately, it remains a draft. But many of the uh, points that have been made in that draft have actually been put into action. But it would be great if uh, it actually were brought into uh, if it was finalized. So what we need to do is really to create an enabling system for women's participation to increase. And that is what is going to lead to a growth in the economy. Uh, thirdly, I think today gender equality is a global concern. It's not just a concern for India. It's a global concern. And it's an issue that concerns both developed and developing countries. And today, I think there is a different emphasis on gender equality, and which is that there is a very strong business case today. Mm. Uh, and what it means is that basically we we, uh, we cannot achieve economic growth without having uh, women's participation. So the IMF has actually said that uh, if India were to um, uh, reach gender parity, then it would boost India's GDP by 27%. And the World Bank uh, also has said that uh, um, you know, India's GDP uh, would grow by 1.5% a year if just 50% of the workforce, uh, uh, female workforce were, were to get into the uh, economy. So uh, yes, the numbers right now are low uh, and we can debate about which numbers are correct, but the fact remains that it is low and the fact remains that we need to do something to uh, bring, an, bring it on par uh, with at least some of the other developing countries. And uh, also, I think uh, when we, we need to understand why it is low. And here, I think I would like to talk about both demand side factors and supply side factors. So if you're talking about, and so far, what's really got attention is the demand side factors, which is that it's uh, it's uh, sociological, there are demographic factors. And, uh, you know, that's really why. And uh, uh, also, I think what's now coming, uh, getting a lot of attention is the caregiving aspect. The mm. fact that unpaid services, uh, women are spending a lot more time. So women are actually spending 10 times more uh, of more the time than men uh, in unpaid uh, care activities. And this is uh, this compares to the global average of 4.3%, so, uh, 4.3 times. So uh, clearly, 
something needs to be corrected um, at the demand side. On the supply side, again, not much attention has been given. And mm. the reason is that we're not looking at what, what are the employment opportunities for women? You know, it's always that women can't, they're not able to. Mm. But what is it that organizations, what is it that the government can do to actually bring them into the, into the workforce? Is the atmosphere congenial? Uh, can they actually draw women? Is there an employer bias? Uh, you know, we, uh, is there an ambition penalty? Because it's women actually want to get into the workforce. They have the ambition, but when they're in the workforce, their ambition is not recognized. And mm. they're given roles that, you know, that, that, are, that are not good or, and they lose their confidence and they feel they don't fit in. So the inclusion is actually not happening from the employer side. So these are issues that really... Uh, need to be uh, addressed. And also when we're talking about the caregiving aspect, uh, here again, I think uh, the whole enabling ecosystem has to change. The whole orientation of companies has to change. It's not, why is the burden on women? Uh, how can men be brought into the caregiving uh, uh, caregiving space? So, uh, you know, so the whole narrative has to change. And also, I mean, if you're talking about, for instance, uh, uh, maternity leave. Maternity leave is equally important. So it's the organization's behavior uh, really that has to uh, that has to change. Um, and I think uh, it's not like government is not making an effort. It will take time for uh, for a lot of this to actually uh, translate into numbers. So uh, for instance, I think uh, we were talking about women entrepreneurship. Uh, definitely, uh, I think a lot is uh, happening in that space. Um, uh, in the digital space, a lot is happening. Uh, today, you can connect. Uh, 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 women can actually get access to finance through, uh, uh, you know, through fintech. And uh, we have now the account aggregators framework, which can actually connect uh, 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 borrowers and lenders uh, seamlessly. But are women being able to actually... Uh, make use of this? Are they aware of it? You know, so we, there is so much to do, even though a lot is happening, a lot more needs to be, uh, needs to be done. But okay. not only should there be a, um, a bottom up approach, but also a top down approach. So that's, that's equally important. But I find that one thing that India is doing right, right now, and which is a very pleasant change uh, from the past, is that our, uh, you know, for instance, we have our National Trade Facilitation Action Plan. We actually lay out uh, uh, gender as uh, as a key action point there, mainstreaming gender as a key action point there. Our foreign trade policy is going to include gender. Our um, FTAs, foreign trade agreements with Canada, with UK, are including gender. Uh, so we are actually looking looking uh, ahead and we are thinking globally. So that's a that's a very good change. So I think the direction is right, but in terms of what can be done, a lot more needs to be done. Okay, uh, you know, thank you, Nisha, for actually laying out this uh, canvas for us. You know, you spoke about women in entrepreneurship. Uh, Sari, I'd like to bring you in. You know, you drive Shiro's, which is a strong community and platform of and for women, and constantly attempting to make space for them on the internet. Uh, you know, from your vantage, what would you say is needed uh, to increase female participation rate in the country? in the workforce. Right, so I think we live in uh, interesting times because on one side, uh, you know, we are seeing what we what I call consumerization of technologies. I think, you know, the 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 broadband revolution, the, the access to internet has been one of the fastest revolutions in, in history of the world. Uh, and just to give you a little context, I think almost 200, to 250 million women came online in the last four to five years, you know, and this is quite unprecedented uh, in history. And what we are seeing is on one hand, of course, we know that our workforce participation numbers are going down. Uh, manufacturing hasn't grown, which was a major employer exactly. in the past. Uh, service sector has been slow to grow. IT services was a huge employer over men in the 90s and now that has been uh, tapering off. What we are really sort of seeing here is on one sector, the, the traditional 
additional pillars are not adding to employment numbers. But what we are also seeing is uh, at a at a larger level, we are seeing consumerization of entrepreneurship. So today, just imagine anybody who came online has a phone, has access to the internet, is potentially an entrepreneur, which means they have a chance to access the process of economic value creation. And digital payments, uh, Aadhaar, everything has sort of made our job a lot more easier. And what that, uh, what we are seeing is at one level, our policy approach is still, still disconnected from the real world developments. You know, so there is a lot of lot of changes that we are seeing on the technology front. But at some level, policy and organizational frameworks are are a little behind this. Second, of course, you know, if you look at India as a country, you know, let me ask you, who looks at women's labor force participation, which ministry's job is this? You know, and it's shocking to hear that it's no ministry's job. You know, it doesn't fall under the women and child ministry because they look at safety and child mortality and reproductive rights. The Ministry of Commerce doesn't look at it. Ministry of Skilling and Workforce doesn't look at it. So this is nobody's baby. This is a giantly important topic that doesn't have the attention of any, any policy conduit you know, per se. And second, like what Nisha said, we do need we do need gender mainstreaming. I think we're making efforts in that direction. But women's labor force participation hasn't really come under under the radar yet. It hasn't mm -hmm. sort of caught the national mainstream yet. As a founder, I have who's worked worked with women for over a decade now and who's seen the growth of Indian technology industry, I can safely say that at some level formal sector job loss is entrepreneurship scale. So what didn't sort of convert in numbers in in the salaried or the wage earner bracket is now sort of converging into different cohorts of entrepreneurial activity. So right from That's interesting. Mm -hmm. as as basic as let's say a YouTube influencer to as as big as let's say the neighborhood peak, uh, the neighborhood parlor, the neighborhood uh, food seller, the WhatsApp uh, commerce person. And interestingly, we we're yet not accounting for a lot of so while we don't account for women's women's caregiving work, we're also not accounting for the new new economic activities, which is actually what's growing the fastest. So if you look at UPI data and we distill it down by gender, I'm sure we're going to find something interesting there. So today we're not doing that. And the truth is, if we are going to look at this challenge in context of 2023, we got to we got to make sure we're not leaving the technology for the behind because technology mm -hmm. is a massive enabler of the Indian economy now. India is on the major digitization path. So in some ways, digitization, entrepreneurship, and access to financial resources is all connected. And that's where everything else sort of plugs into it. Skilling, uh, of course, policy, organizational frameworks. And we know there's so much happening in the world, right? From AI to remote work to post-COVID uh, entrepreneurial surge. Uh, and we also know that the world is losing jobs faster than ever before. Mm. What was job loss is now probably has turned into entrepreneurial activity, but we haven't yet put our finger on it to say, how do we account for it and how do we catalyze it? Like my firm belief is uh, if India added more capital in hands of women, it'll become catalytic. You know, just mm. imagine literally putting capital in hands of, let's say, 5 million women to set up their own little business, each of these 5 million women will employ another 10 to 25 people. It has a massive GDP impact. So I think we need to sort of refresh our approach to, to the process of GDP creation and women's workforce participation. And that's where a lot of our India digitization story plays out. Right. Right. So yeah, this is, uh, you know, it's, it's absolutely true in the sense that uh, we have this massive push with digital uh, digitization, digitalization, fueling entrepreneurship, you know, coming in with the India stack, you know, actually uh, leading to something uh, where women can be empowered and there is space for women. And also a very good point on the fact that, you know, uh, the Internet economy can power women and perhaps, you know, those numbers need to be taken into account. Uh, 
Jai, you know, you deal with executive search. And, you know, as Pairi pointed out, if India wants to be this five to ten trillion dollar economy, it has to ensure employability of youth and it has to drive women into the workforce. So those are the two ways for us That's to it. manage to do it. Now, the yeah. share of women in senior and managerial positions in India is very low at, at about 15 odd percent. And there are only nine percent of firms with women as top managers. Uh, we all recognize, and you know, it has been said on this forum that companies succeed with more women on the roads. So, you know, from your vantage, tell us why are companies not able to create this environment for women to advance? And what must women and men and companies do so that women can do? Uh, uh, we don't need to sit down. Uh, if you look at it, you know, uh, this is a perception. Uh, you know, uh, they say that they're giving too much of. You know, uh, uh, you know, diversity, hiring people, talking about it. They're giving, saying that you know we want women to grow in the you know in, in the organization, and they say we want women everywhere. But you know, what I see in the last three decades of my exit research experience, you know, I've seen the the, the rate declining as far as the exit hiring in women is concerned. Now there are really? various reasons for that. Absolutely, absolutely, and there are various reasons for that. You know. See, even at the entry level, if you see, you know, though they get into that, but as they as they grow in the career path, you know, they have family reasons, they get married, and eventually they put the, you know, they say, hey, we got married, you got a kid, so it's the women's responsibility to take care of the kid, and not the, you know, the male's responsibility, and and it is the in-laws also say, hey, no, no, you know, you, why don't you take care of your son or a daughter? It all starts from their A, and B, when they start coming back to work. And they, they should be, you know, the, the employer should give them the comfort feel as far as, you know, leave policies are concerned. I think, you know, Nisha touched upon that, you know, where, you know, you don't give leave facility, you know, where though we have, you know, a maternity leave of six months, but I mean, you can't, you know, start working from there, right? And so what happens? The kid is dying at home, you know, you need to go back there. And somebody calls, hey, they said, you know, uh, you know you, the kid is, you know, why don't take care of them? That's two. And three, you know, the organization should give them the benefit of, you know, like, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, I don't know, maternity leave, which also have, you know, some kind of a, the a kid care center, you know, in the office where, you know, they can take care of it. IT started it in the, in the earlier instance, the IT organization started that and they gave all the facilities, but eventually they kind of scaled it down, if you could see. And, and not many women, you know, you know they, they start the career and when they come at 35, 40, at the peak of the career, they kind of you know take a next step because their children will get into the graduation and for them the masters is important graduation is important and they'll try to you know be with their children to see to that how to get the graduation and the masters and then slowly you know the in parents and in laws you know, they are reached seventies and eighties of the years and to take care of them and who will take care of them and slowly they start passing the baton to the women and women you know. Uh, they've been, you know, on every walks of life with us. And I mean, personally, you know, I was, I, you know, my daughter also works there. I tell, listen, you should also give it to the, the, the response to my son too. So they kind of balance it out, but not too many do that. And that affects too much on their career path. And, you know, though they say, you know, they want diversity hiring, I mean, the statistics talks about it, but even today in, in tech or non-tech, show me more in tech, show me how many women leaders are there or how many male leaders are there. And, and that speaks about it, you know, though everybody, you know, say that, yes, we want to hire women, you know, in, in, in uh, you know, every walk of life, but not truly. And if you look at blue collared, and that's the toughest place. And, you know, uh, we have not seen any, you know, uh, uh, women executives in a, in a, in a, a manufacturing or a blue collared uh, you know, organizations. I mean, one or two, maybe a you know example like you know, like you know Indra Nui from the FMCG sector, she became number one. But if you look at manufacturing, let's say uh, you know a Toyota or uh, you know uh, a BMW or a Mercedes or uh, any manufacturing company, hardcore you know a tool dying company, show me a women leader. No, there again, you know they say that okay, men can do better. That's what there's a huge discrepancy happening there. But again. Somewhere, you know, they should give the cue to the women saying that, you no, know, a lot of, you know, skilling should be done. A lot of facility should be given to the women. And, you know, and, and, and also I should, though I, it is, it's the right platform to bring this particular topic, period leave. In fact, uh, David Fisher is seeing India today. 
and uh, there was a discussion happening and you know they were talking about period leave and women get cramps what are they supposed to do they have to be in office and they can't take a leave and in a, in a garment or any in a blue colored company you know, they have to work they have to there and and they will try to compare their you know uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the based uh, the productivity based on the men not fair not at all fair and they should give some kind of you know over the you know the maternity leave they should give for this menstruation leave or you know a child take uh, uh, you know taking care of leave i mean parents and in-laws leave i mean these are the benefits if you give to men and say hey listen don't worry you work from home you know let's say if a maternity leave, you take one year be at home work from home we are there with you show me how many companies did that a and b even they said oh, they, and there was a recent you know there some tech firms i not to i don't want to name the name of the firms they said you know uh, we are going to hire people you know uh, who took, took a break for 3 to 4 years what happened they they came back but they were not able to accommodate them because their peers were trying to push them hey you took a break for 3 years the tech has changed as sari was telling new tech is playing a significant role ai ml your blockchain you you name it that has taken a new turn and and it's it's difficult for the women to immediately learn of course two years three years there completely there's a huge gap and how do you you know uh, you know give them the you know the training on on the new tech for them to catch with uh, you know with, with other people in the system and though we speak but still i think still lot 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 to be done globally also let me put it that way even if oh, i right. want to give a or, or the light away if i want to give okay. an example patan sharuk khan earned more money deepika padukone didn't earn that much money again <laughs> what's the, what's the gender equality we're talking about it all right you know you're basically saying that you know uh, when uh, rubber hits the road that's where things are not changing on the ground there is there is uh, a lot of work that needs to be done even organizational mindset i think they have framed it and they uh, you know uh, put in their purpose but that uh, purpose needs to meet some action essentially that Absolutely. is what uh, you are telling us you know that is so, so that i think jay that i think <laughs> yeah. jay is the opportunity you know that exists for uh, yeah. for india advaita you know you now heard all of them right uh, you know what are your thoughts and from your vantage how do you see you know because uh, you know you you watch uh, Uh, society and how are you seeing uh, women help other women succeed you know men help women succeed right so i you know uh, the first thing is of course uh, women women do work most all women work we're just not paid for it so that's that's a reality as well and a quick fix is if you if you pay women for home work, uh, for housework um i've read figures that say that something like 13% of your gdp annual gdp will increase if you just acknowledge the fact that women are working and need to be compensated we've seen this happen over and over again in fact the most progressive aspects of our society have been the law uh, the j- courts because when there were situations wherein uh, dependents lost their parents and uh, they had to calculate uh, insurance companies went to court and all of those kind of things happened uh, and they had to calculate you know the contribution now for a father it's very easy to do that right because you calculate his age how many years of service he has left equals this much money which he would have earned if he had lived his full life and you can transfer that over what about the mother what did she bring to the table and as cruel as it sounds in the in the in the instance of such a devastating tragedy where you lose both your parents the courts have made an attempt to calculate what a woman uh, would earn in terms of contribute financially by just her being alive and not necessarily you know going out to work every day so i think it's exceedingly important that we start first from the perspective that women do work in fact we all work i would say 100% women work maybe 100% men don't work <laughs> so that 82% <laughs> because they have the option to work you know women women have so many issues when it comes to getting out into the workforce so i think we're doing better in terms of that we just need to know how to acknowledge and quantify the work that women do so that's the first thing the second thing is of course looking at south asia itself and uh, i found it very interesting while researching for this program that um, you know bangladesh is ahead of us 
Sri yeah. Lanka is ahead of us. Nepal is ahead of us ahead in of terms of like women participation. And this is because of, you know, in Sri Lanka, for example, because I'm sorry, in Bangladesh, because of the ready made garment factory. So the Indian government has picked up on the fact that, you know, MSMEs will have a role to play when it comes to increasing women participation in the labor force. So you have a lot of schemes and entrepreneurships as well. Let me just say, even in this new startup economy, only 10% of these startups are run by women. And if you ask me about uh, unicorns, you know, everyone loves to talk about unicorns. Uh, I can only no, think no, of, more, no more. No more. Is it okay? no, yeah, yeah, it's over. This is all... Okay. Yeah, we were doing it in 2021 and 2020. We're not okay. doing it. You're yeah. not doing it now? Okay. <laughs> the mm -hmm. But, but you know, I mean, there's only like 10% of these startups are, are run by women. Mm -hmm. So even 22% uh, in STEM and AI, AI in particular, which is the next big thing, right? Only 22, 23% are of uh, women in, in AI in India. So STEM and STEAM now. You know, the participation of women, even when you look at uh, the jobs of today and tomorrow, women are not not finding a space there. So I think this requires a very holistic viewpoint. And and I was listening to Jay and Jay. I've been involved in that debate over the menstrual leave. And mm -hmm. you seem to be saying that it should happen. In fact, I took That's an alternative right. view because um, I looked at the Swedish government, which is, which sort of, you know, is when we are, when, um, you know, Nisha was talking about having a certain female perspective or feminist perspective, which is what Sweden does when it formulates its policies and looks at its budgeting. And the feminist perspective I want to highlight here is not uh, female superiority, superiority, but basically gender balance and inclusivity. So looking at it from that lens, I think it's exceedingly important that we understand what where our schemes are being used. So if you have the Pradhan Mantri uh, Mudra Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Rozgar Yojana, you have SEAT, you have TRED, you have a lot of these schemes coming in that are encouraging women to become entrepreneurs and employ women. But when you have something like in the corporate world and menstrual leave, are we then going to have corporate saying we don't want to hire women because she's going to get two days a month extra <laughs> which is going to be uh 24 days in a year and her productivity will be impacted and if you look at statistics with menstrual leave it's about 24 to 25 percent of women who actually have the kind of pain that needs medical intervention anecdotally being women we know women who need injections for pain we know women who can run marathons when on their period you know it's a whole spectrum of experience so a country like Sweden, I mean, uh, I was I was interested in what they were doing, and they 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 definitely focus on menstrual aw menstrually aware workplaces, and I think that's really the shift we need. We don't need to have more leaves or more uh, you know privileges in the workplace, but really a, a whole shift in the way that we view the workplace and how it can accommodate women and their changing demands, lifestyle demands. And like it has for men, like it does for mental health. Uh, you know, this is very important. And why don't we why don't we give menstrual health that importance that we do mental health? Because menstrual health only applies to women, whereas men's, uh, mental health applies to men and women. So I think we need to be a little more assertive even uh, within our communities, our, our spaces in terms of ensuring that women are taken more seriously in all aspects of life. And I know that's sort of a generic viewpoint. And I know that most of us do that in our own lives. But to make that shift, it's essential that we have some sort of plan in place. And I agree with Sari, you know, I mean, it's, it's alarming that we don't have a specific ministry that would look at this, because I think it's the need of the hour. It's the need of the hour to be able to say that, yes, this is my benchmark and here's what I'm going to do to deliver these results. No one's accountable to women, you know. Back in the day, it was like a sari and a, and a pressure cooker and give me your vote. And I think women now have to sort of move away from that kind of handout and not expect that handout even at the corporate level or, at, uh, or from our leadership. So... That's just my... So I, I don't think women actually expect any sort of a handout. I think the, the idea here is just, as you pointed out, you know, is uh, to make uh, an option available to women and give them that flexibility. So to be, as you said, you know, more aware corporates and to bring in that awareness and say that, hey, we're here to support in case if you need support, 
you know if you don't need support well that's also all well and good uh, but you know nisha uh, a lot of people have pointed out to uh, women in science and tech and each year 40% of most stem graduates in india are women but they uh, they are only, uh, only 14% of them end up in jobs in universities in our institutes and in our corporates you know we even lose out on that signaling value of showcasing our women, showcasing women to other women so now we have you know this uh, tech a play which is happening with data ai and ml you know technology is shaping the future but if women are not part of shaping the tech then what sort of a future do you see our girls inheriting yeah i think uh, you know we are again talking about there is a uh, there is a uh, there are a lot of women available there who are qualified again i would say uh, it's a supply side issue why are organizations not hiring i think that's that's what we need to address and uh, you know it, uh, i was listening into what uh, jay was saying and you know all the burden seems to be falling on the woman give her give her this privilege give her this flexibility no it has to be men and women it has to be maternity leave and paternity leave it has to be caregiving by men and women so can we actually put in place can organizations actually put in place something like uh, something like sensitizing men and building their capabilities for caregiving we don't think about that and one very important thing i think uh, uh, it, i think it's one of the finest policies that has come up in the last one year which is that sebi has actually brought out a regulation which makes it mandatory for the top 1000 firms to bring out gender disaggregate to disclose gender disaggregated information on employment at all levels including board members uh, on uh, 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 turnover rates on return to work rates on maternity leave paternity leave also and also on skill development so you so if companies are going to be reporting data at uh, gender disaggregated data obviously they will see what is happening and this gives them the tool to actually address it and uh, what's uh, what's really uh, good about this policy is that it's applicable not just to these top 1000 firms but also to uh, also to their value chain partners so that really increases the scope of uh, uh, th this mandation and uh, and that's where we can begin so organizations will automatically now look they have to look at these issues and they need to think ahead and they need to prepare themselves on how to mainstream gender into their corporate culture the whole culture has to change the way the organization looks at men and women has to change but, but yes. you know uh, nisha you pointed out uh, you know you you brought in sebi but how long can regulator inter interventions continue to be the mechanism of increase gender diversity it's mandatory to report but that's really the starting point you need to know what's happening in the company we earlier we didn't even have the data to tell us how many men and women are there in a company so and this will help companies to structure or devise their policies which would be which would mainstream gender so any policy that is made in a company would take into account the gender workforce Uh, in the company so it's uh, you know so it's it's we're not talking about reservation we're not talking about how many women are there which we're talking about how to include them and how to make the it's also about sensitizing corporations to how to get women into the in, into the workforce you know instead of the way the organizations are looking at women force today is that uh, that they will take leave maternity leave 6 months maternity leave today is a penalty because from the organization's point of view if a woman is going to be out for 6 months well why should we hire her but that is what has to change make it 3 months paternity and 3 months uh, pater paternity and 3 months maternity you'll see a big change all right okay. or well, if it's 7 days casual leave let it be 4 days for caregiving for men and for women Okay yeah you know that's that's a good point i mean you know it's it's the way that you can actually tweak certain policies you know so you make them uh, supportive to women and then you know also uh, ensure that you know caregiving also becomes a part of something that men do uh, sairi you know the world is changing right the way we work is changing covid spurred the gig economy and it gave women so much flexibility you know which is i think uh, what a lot of women want and which was missing so in the gig economy we saw that you know women grabbed that uh, opportunity with 
both hands. How, how do you see India actually shaping up for women to be in jobs? You know, with all the changes uh, that we see right now. Absolutely. So picking up from you know what Nisha said, I think if we start reporting. Uh, gender data in our annual reports, in our public listing analyst uh, calls, it will make a difference. You're not changing, you're not asking people to do anything. You're you're just adding a layer of data, which is not a big overhead. I think there are some short-term incentive alignment I would I would bat for. For example, really incentivizing remote work. I mean, remote work is probably one of the biggest tools of bringing in more women in workforce. And remote work, I mean, we are the we are the office for the world. Why can't India adopt this in a in a major way? And this is something we've seen in our work. I mean, small town India doesn't have the opportunities that large cities have, but work is pretty pretty seamlessly connected now. It, there is a real chance of bringing in more women in the in the corporate mainstream. Uh, mobility. I think mobility is something India is tackling at an infra level. We're making sure. Commuting becomes safer. I know Delhi government said you women can travel in buses free, and now Bangalore is doing that. I think these are small incentives, but they set the right tone. It says, "Hey, it, let let's take away some friction from your journey." You know, the other sort of big lever I think is we really need to think about economic incentives. So, for example, women-run enterprises. I know India did this whole software economic zones. Uh, we uh, we've done economic zones in the past. I think we need to go back to that playbook because it did create industries out of it. We need to incentivize the process of building businesses, whether it's small and medium businesses, large companies, software companies, export houses, by women. So capital incentives are really important. So whether it's no tax zones or no tax regimes, they will really change the game because nothing, nothing makes things go faster when when consumers adopted themselves, you know, there is a reason why WhatsApp is in every hand and UPI is in every hand because these are frictionless, well incentivized products. And I think we need to go back to those playbooks. These playbooks exist in our economic history. So that we don't even have to redesign them. And then, of course, I think we really need to promote economic activity for women. So, for example, government has a lot of capital available for women, for example, uh, you know, initiatives like. Nabard, Sidbi, uh, funds for men, fund of funds. I do think these are tip of the iceberg. We need to sort of mainstream them, you know, as much as UPI, that if you're a woman and you, you need capital to build a business, it should become very, very easy for you to do so. The best part is we are a country that's producing some of the finest fintech and financial services solutions mm -hmm. in the world. Uh, so we have the tools to make this happen. What we don't have is the policy owner to make this happen. Yes, our PM says this this is important, but after that, we don't have like a co-owner of this very large mandate. So we do need that. And we need incentive, incentives, which are commercial incentives. I think everyone knows this is the right thing to do. Now, how hmm. do you practically make it happen without this becoming a burden? And I think some of the things that maternity leave law, posh law, they were steps in the right direction. But they were not exactly frictionless. They didn't create commercial incentives for industry to pick it up and run. And we know nothing moves capitalism like incentives, right? Human beings are aligned by incentives. And I would say modularization of work, entrepreneurial activity, access to capital, and creation of, of uh, special economic uh, vehicles to make this happen will sort of move the needle. Bangladesh did the same thing. You know, they they made sure it became easier for women to work in factories and they aligned their largest economic engine of textiles to women. And, you know, we had the results. So I think if we were to take a view of, let's say, five to 10 years, these four or five measures will play a massive role. All right. You know, all good points. Uh, what do you say to uh, Advaita's point that let's start paying women for housework? Absolutely. I think money i mean at a broader view i totally agree with this the more money we put in hands of our people the larger our economy becomes so it may seem like a short term stretch but look ultimately that money will come back in the economy it will go into spending saving capital formation all good all good measures you know and i think it what it will do is it will create 
it will create a sense of gender equality that's very hard for us as a patriarchal, patriarchal society to build. You know, right. money right. is your stand, so so be it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Advaita, you know, we know that job equals status plus identity layer plus money plus freedom plus choices, right? So, you know, talk about, uh, you know, uh, how, uh, you know, do you see uh, the impact that employment could have on empowerment, on financial independence and freedom uh, and the role it can play in actually liberating women? Massive, massive. And, uh, you know, just listening to the speakers, I, I I, want to suggest, and I think I'm going to advocate for this, is is there should be a special economic zone just for women entrepreneurs and workers. And we'll show you how it's done, you know, how what kind of workplaces you need to have, what kind of sexual harassment committees you need to have, what kind of menstrually aware workplaces you have, maternity leave, all of it. So I almost feel like, you know... The, some may think it's dystopian. I just think it would be a fascinating thing to really see how women can run things when given the opportunity to do it in an organized way, in the way that we are so indulgent of, uh, you know, special economic zones for IT or for other things. So that's our logistics. That's one thing. Uh, but on an uh, on an aside on that, uh, you know, I, I just... Um, Jay brought up that point that why does Shah Rukh Khan get to pay, uh, you know, get paid more than Deepika Padukone? It's basically because our even our industry, our film industry is male dominated. I remember when my film Kahani was being made about 10, 12 years ago, it was very hard to get the project greenlit because it was a pregnant woman. A story of a pregnant woman. And that just wasn't the kind of proposition that producers look out for. And and I dare say, uh, you know, it has changed, but not a lot has changed. And there's an economic reason for why our films are so male dominated. So linking back to your point about financial independence, it's usually the man of the house who makes the decision in terms of what to watch. And uh, that means when the family goes out for a movie, it's the man of the house who's primarily making that decision and deciding where to put that money. So you'll have a family entertainer or you'll have a male, uh, or, you know, male dominated films. A single theater um, uh, system will have more male dominated th uh, films because men will come back and come back for the movies and not bring the women so i so the hence what happens is that it translates into what deepika padukone gets paid because she's not able to open a film in the way a shahrukh khan is able to open a film because he's opening a film for men and deepika will do it mostly for women if she's in what is called a female centric film mm -hmm. and uh, the second thing is when i write for television it's entirely the reverse so the men were, I, I and mean, this is fascinating because I went, I first started writing for film and then I moved into tech TV and the TV brief was that it's all about the women. The men are like French fries in the McDonald's, <laughs> you know, it's all about the women because what happens on TV is the man is out of the house, traditional home from nine to six thirty seven, and the remote control is in the hand of the woman. So that's when she's chopping her vegetables, she's doing her darning or whatever she's doing, she's watching TV. And the stories that she wants to do are women's, uh, are to do with her life experiences, her viewpoint, the female gaze. So it was lovely for me to be on TV, although sometimes, you know, they were kind of stereotype typical in their in their portrayals, but it was wonderful to have that sort of focus on the female experience, which really links back to your uh, question about financial independence what financial independence does is really give you choice and that choice means where to spend your money where to spend your time two very valuable things and when women don't have that choice uh, the world doesn't value them quite in the same way as they deserve to be it's really that right you know my last question now you know this is for you Jay. gender parity at the workplace and pay parity you know you already uh, painted a very gloomy picture for us when it comes to corporates and organizations and, you know, uh, the way they uh, sort of really do not pay too much attention to advancing women. But when do you see this happening in India? Gender parity and pay parity. Uh, before that, you know, I was just hearing to what, you know, Nisha and Advaita and Sari was talking about. I want to make two, three points here. I'm not asking about discrimination here, you know, but women should be given leave, men should not be, or men should be given a lot. My thing is give flexibility to women. They do home chores and also they do, you know, office work and, and they are 360 degree everywhere. Okay. The only thing is 
if you give them the flexibility, if you give them, you know, as I just said, if you give money to their hand, they spend it, it comes back to the economy. What we're talking about, we're talking about the women's development, women's, you know, uh, empowerment for the GDP and the growth of the economy. Now, if you give the flexibility to women, this will certainly happen, A. B, you know, even when somebody talked about, you know, the uh, women entrepreneurship and startup companies happened, there were very few women. Why? Because when you go to the bank, they ask for collateral. Women collateral versus men. When men go to the bank, you know, and they give the bank, you know, loan to them because he has ancestral property. A. B, you know, women, you know, though there's a property of mine, I would not pass on to my daughter completely or anybody for that matter. There again, she fails that. I've seen very few women entrepreneurs, you know, who really made it big and apparently on their own. Was there a, one is this, the social fabric support which they did that? Not too sure. At the same time, you know, somebody should give them the flexibility in, on all counts, be at home, be at office, be it at the government, be it, you know, in all, in all platform, it should be given equal, you know, respect to them and flexibility to them. That's what I'm saying in this, in this, in this panel. Secondly, as answering your question, you know, on the, you know, uh, you know, women's, uh, you know, uh, uh, participation, you know, in, in the corporate. One is the, you know, the compensation disparity is even still there. Though we talk about grades in tech or non-tech, any industry there are, you know, even from right from, you know, a CEO, you know, a classic example, a CEO in, you know, Bank of America, um, um, men versus women, there is some kind of a disparity. We can always check the records. And this is what happens across the, don't, not to take the name, but this is what happens. Unless you don't take care of, because A, I mean, she would have taken a break for a couple of years. And when she come back, somebody who's been, you know, two, three years above him. So obviously he'll be paid more. You need to bridge that gap by giving, the, you know, say, okay, work from home for some time and everything will be taken care of. We'll give the comfort feel to you and you'll be the participator for the, the growth of the company, growth of the country and growth of the economy. That's how I look at it. Secondly, and even the, the titles, you know, most of the times what they happen, you know, it all depends on their hiring manager. The hiring manager takes a call on who should be, you know, taken, given a grade A or grade B or VP or a senior VP or a managing director or a CXO. It all depends on the hiring manager's, you know, thing. So why do you allow that? So don't look at A on the, you know, the, on the, on the experience, but again, what is the strength women has got into the organization? And what she did in the past and what she's going to do in the future and how she's kind of supported the firm. And that is how the way forward is my thinking. And it will certainly help in totality. All right. So, you know, essentially what I'm hearing from all of you is we need a shift when it comes to the lens. And something that, uh, you know, Nisha underlined right at the uh, beginning is that, you know, you need to have that gender lens and gender mainstreaming to happen in every aspect of our endeavor, you know, so that uh, we can really encourage women to go forward. The world is changing. Things are shifting. Technology will be a big player. And we really need to uh, power our women uh, to be up there. Hopefully, India, while it has the policies, will also be able to have a roadmap, uh, you know, where we can drive this economy. And really, you know, uh, as uh, has been uh, said by uh, the government, that not just women's development, but make it women-led development. Mm -hmm. Uh, on that note, thank you so very much, all of you, for joining me here today and for sharing your thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.